Hello there. It might be unfair on headless chickens to compare them to the new Labour establishment as it tries to craft a response to Jeremy Corbyn. We'll look at the different strategies they're adopting in a moment, but first, what are they up against? Mr Corbyn has been at a rally in Ealing in West London tonight, several hundred people there. For them, politics has been reinvigorated by his presence. We haven't seen much inside the Corbyn rallies. It's not about the oratory or the sharp suits. So James Clayton went along. These are some of the lucky ones. They've got to Jeremy Corbyn's speech an hour before kickoff to make sure they can actually get into the 570 capacity Ealing Town Hall. What do you think of Corbyn in one word? How does he make you feel? I, th I think it's a breath of fresh air. That's more than one word. Oh, absolutely. Brilliant, brilliant. Radical, radical, different. I'm going to geezer. He's inspirational. He's a legend. <laughs> what was that, sorry? He's a legend. He's a legend. He's a legend. Why do you think that? I just think I love his policies and I feel that some of them will be radical, but I think that they could possibly change Labour for the better and change the country for the better. Guys, we're going to do an interview. As the main hall filled out, Corbyn fulfilled his media requirements and we managed to follow him around. On a day when Andy Burnham said that he would embrace Jeremy Corbyn into his team, I asked him whether he'd let Burnham serve in his shadow cabinet. This is uh, an election which neither of us have been elected to yet, so it seems slightly forward to start offering positions. But he's your preferred candidate now. Obviously, there has to be um, a party of all the talents, and of course, we can work together, and that is an easy thing to do. But Andy Burnham said that he'll work with you, you'll work with him as well. Yes, of course. And all the others. Well, I'm not sure that everyone else is totally on that page as yet, but I'm sure they will be in time. Well, we're going to go outside first, then to the first Overspill, then to the main hall. Is that right? Just to say hello to the yeah, yeah. fans. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. By now, the main hall was full, so Jeremy decided to address the hundred or so people outside who hadn't managed to get into the building. Fantastic, Jeremy. Thank you very much. Listen, first of all, apologies that uh, not everybody can get in the town hall tonight. There are obviously limits to the numbers of people that can get into the building. There's obviously safety requirements, and I'm sure you'd all understand that and appreciate that. Next up, Corbyn moved to the overflow room for an unexpected surprise. The very fact that Corbyn has an overflow room for when he speaks has left his opponents shocked. Can you believe how many people are here, It's the big one now. This is uh, yeah. this isn't the biggest part of actually. We had 2,000 in yeah. Leeds last week. We had 2,500 in London. I don't know how many people. It's a very large number. It's incredible. It's this kind of reception that even Corbyn wouldn't have believed he'd received even a couple of months ago. Corbyn mania, call it what you will. Jeremy Corbyn is now the bookies' favourite and his opponents are racking their brains in search of a line of attack that will convince Labour supporters he's not a future leader. James Clayton at the Jeremy Corbyn rally tonight. A taste of the buzz generated within and without and the strong sense of a mission shared between those present. Well, I'm not sure the other three candidates actually even have rallies. As such, they address meetings. Anyway, it's fair to say Labour Party grandees are not as excited about Corbyn as the new members of the party. For example, later in the programme, you're going to hear from Neil Kinnock. It's actually in a piece we've been filming over recent weeks on the closing of the last British coal mines. Now, Lord Kinnock didn't want to get drawn into the Labour leadership election directly. He's backing Andy Burnham. But his comments really made his views very clear. I can see why people are angry and want to protest. But then they've got to make a decision whether they want to be part of a Labour movement which produced a political party to seriously contest the democratic power, or they want to be in perpetual demonstration, which is fulfilling and noble, but ultimately rarely effective. Well, the truth is that the fight by the right for the party has not gone well. Subtle attacks, unsubtle attacks, Nothing seems to have broken through. The Corbyn enthused all say that any attack from the right makes them more, not less keen on their man. The idea of whittling the three opponents of Mr Corbyn down to one to sharpen the fight, well, that didn't get any traction. Plots to pause the contest, no effect. And now it's come down to a serious divergence of strategy between the two leading opponents of Jeremy Corbyn. Yvette Cooper, 
is taking him on. Andy Burnham is adopting the, if you can't beat him, approach. Jeremy has brought real energy to this race. I want to capture that and would involve Jeremy in my team from the outset. I want the people who are drawn to his campaign, particularly young people, to help us rebuild our party from the bottom up, to re-energise it, make it the people's party once again. Andy Burnham cozying up to Mr Corbyn, or Jeremy, as he calls him. And you've heard Mr Corbyn repay the compliment earlier. Now, Ms Cooper and Mr Burnham are reportedly now each suggesting the other should step aside. Plainly, the candidates in this election of a non-Corbyn variety seem unable to agree on an approach uh, to dealing with him. Well, I'm joined by Tristram Hunt, the Shadow Education Secretary, who's not in the Jeremy Corbyn camp. Good evening to you. No. You're backing Liz Kendall. Who's your second preference? My second preference is for Yvette Cooper. I thought the speech she gave last Thursday, setting out her agenda, was really, really passionate and convincing. And I think, following your clip, the, the position she's taken to take on some of the arguments of Jeremy Corbyn, some of the backward-looking programme he seems to embody, is exactly the right strategy, that we should have this full, open and frank debate about the future of the party and differing political traditions and differing political approaches within it. And what do you think of the Burnham approach that we started seeing today, uh, much more friendly towards Corbyn, trying to sort of say, look, I like the guy, I want to I work with him? I don't think it's about the man, it's about the political programme. Mm. And my politics as Yvette's, as Liz Kendall's, are not about withdrawing from Europe. Uh, they're not about uh, an industrial policy which seems to emerge from the early 1970s. It's about a future of Britain which encapsulates modern Britain. And I think the, the criticism one has of Jeremy Corbyn is not about the authenticity and the veracity of the man. It's about a very old-fashioned, Benite political programme which doesn't speak to modern Britain and certainly won't speak to an electorate in 2020. Right. Can I be clear, is there a kind of now, is it clear that what one might have called the Blairite wing or the, the, the new Labour wing, the, the right, the, the bit of the party to which you are subscribed, David Miliband today said he's backing Liz Kendall, Yvette Cooper second, is that now the kind of the official position for your wing of the party, Kendall, Yvette? No, I, th I think I think it, it's variable. I mean, my my colleague Gloria De Piero is backing Andy Burnham right, second. Okay. I think I think there are lots of so there it's are a lots bit of a mess because you can't is, agree really, no, can you? I mean, it is but, a bit of a mess. But isn't this it? is what's interesting. I've been talking to Labour members in Essex and Suffolk today, right. in Ipswich and Colchester, um, and I think this election is far more open than people think. There are a lot of undecided voters out there. I'm not saying that there isn't a great deal of enthusiasm for Jeremy Corbyn and we've seen those fantastic pictures right. and people have joined the party, but actually amongst members up and down the country where you haven't got uh, some of the, the Corbyn mania, there's a lot of undecided voters and I would just urge a degree of caution from the media that actually this is more open than they think. To what extent do you think the, the, the Blairites only have themselves to blame? for the predicament they found themselves in with Corbyn stealing the show in this election. They've, they've basically, they've had nothing interesting to say for the last three years, perhaps. Abdicated the, the kind of the intellectual position. I think, I think one of the faults has been that we were not proud enough and vocal enough under the previous leadership of defending our record in government. And when we think about the remarkable radical achievements of Tony Blair and Gordon Brown on the minimum wage, on devolution, on peace in Northern Ireland, on raising taxes for the NHS, on transforming our education system, actually we seem to disavow that legacy. And so lots of people have joined the party who haven't really appreciated the extraordinary transformation of the public realm, almost the, the sort of civilising in large parts of Britain under the Labour government. And, and if you haven't heard good things about Labour in power, everyone thinks, oh, well, it's terrible to be in power, you just sell out Tony your principles. Blair, and that's what Jeremy Corbyn is appealing to. Tony Blair has explained it, and instead of seeming to get swathes of people back to kind of new Labour politics, it seems to have driven people into the hands of Jeremy Corbyn. What's going but, but, but on you there? Need to roll, you need to roll the pitch. You can't just turn up and say, by the way, it was all fantastic. Actually, we need to remind ourselves and tell us the stories about that. And that's also, I think, about a reckoning with Tony Blair. And one of the things I hope to see in the coming years is a celebration of Tony Blair as part of our great lineage, as part of the history of our party, but also an appreciation that we go forward beyond his shadow. And whoever's the next leader, I hope they accept Tony 
Tony within you know the pantheon of great Labour leaders and then look to the future and we and maybe it's because of Chilcot, Chilcot I don't know but we we seem to have this psychological hurdle with Tony that we need to get over right. now you've said you I think I'm right in saying you, you said you won't serve in a in a Corbyn cabinet You've set up this group, it's called uh, the Common Good, the Labour for the Common Good group. You've written email to most Labour MPs, the ones who aren't supporting Jeremy Corbyn. Are you plotting as head of the resistance if Corbyn wins? Well, first of all, as, as Jeremy said, he hasn't won. As I've said yeah, at the yeah. beginning, this is an open he's contest. He's favourite, though, isn't he? Second, secondly, you know, it would be a great presumption to think that he'd want me to serve. No, it's going to be but, a shadow cabinet my, election. So but, you could stand for election to yeah. go into the shadow cabinet or you could choose to stand aside. Yeah, no, I, I would not uh, seek to be elected to a Jeremy Corbyn shadow cabinet because my politics are different to his. So you on would Europe, seek to undermine economy, him rather no, than no. to work No, no, I mean, there are huge inside. numbers of members of the Parliamentary Labour Party who support the Labour Party in outstanding ways who don't serve on the front bench. I will serve the interests of my constituency of Stoke-on-Trent in Parliament, which is a huge privilege and a duty and a responsibility. And part of the group that uh, I'm setting up, which is part of a myriad of groups as we deal with the sort of colossal loss at the general election is about reviving the ideas and the politics of the Labour Party, how we deal with globalisation, how we tackle inequality without retreating uh, to the old policies, how we deal with climate change, all these big issues which I think we want a sort of progressive modernising response to. And it seems only fair that we have these, these kind of groups in Parliament to develop those ideas. So I look forward... One of the few things I look forward to as we face uh, uh, opposition is, is the discussion about the revival of social democracy. Right. If Jeremy Corbyn wins, or if any of the others win, do you think it likely there will be another leadership election before 2020, before the next general election? For example, one where you have to go through a renewal of the vows, so to speak, uh, re-elect the leader, or because whatever, whoever's elected isn't going to cut the mustard by 2020. Are you expecting another leadership election? Well, we need to see who's elected and we need to see how if they... And, and, and we need to see how they we need to see how they conduct themselves. If, uh, Corbyn, I think if Corbyn won, do you think he would make it through to 2020? I don't know. It's a, it's a long period of time and I think this is one of the challenges we face about the, the immediacy of the election contest after the loss. And one of the reasons I'm supporting Liz Kendall is I think she's the candidate who can grow over the parliament so that by 2020 you've got a very good candidate in place for the general election. What we're trying to pick here, Evan, is not a leader of the opposition who makes us feel good in our constituency Labour Party meetings on a Thursday. It is a prospective Labour Prime Minister who makes the tough, challenging decisions built upon Labour values and Labour principles. And as the ballot papers drop to members, I think that's the question they've got to have in their minds. Would you stand in 2017, 2018, if there was another election, leadership election? I think this is all sort of uh, speculation. I'm, right. We need to find who's going to be the winner. But what I am interested in is being part of the conversation and the grouping, which gets us in a viable place for 2020 and doesn't repeat the trauma of 2015, because it is constituents in Stoke-on-Trent and other parts of the country who are going to be hammered by this government. And the, you know, the issue we have with Jeremy Corbyn is about the indulgence that people feeling good about themselves in the Labour Party rather than doing good for the country. And that's what the Labour Party is about. Tristram Hunt, thank you very much. Thanks. I've been